Thank you.
Good evening, everybody. Is everybody enjoying their dinner out there? All right. Well, I want to thank you all again for having some fun with me at my school today. Um, just one quick note before we talk about the, uh, the program for the rest of the evening. Um, the, the full dome shows at the planetarium start promptly at 8 o'clock. We had a lot of people that wanted to get material in there, and we're very happy to be able to offer this opportunity to see all these full-length programs, but that's got to stay right on the schedule, okay? Um, so our uh, topic for right now, um, I'm very, very pleased to have this gentleman in, uh, join us tonight. You know, when you think about your favorite cosmologist, right? I mean, close your problems. I know who you guys are thinking about, but my favorite cosmologist is standing right over there tonight. Um, Will Kinney grew up under the dark skies of Montana, and his graduate students tell me he's uh, got a pretty good hand with a telescope as well, but he's, he studies astronomy in a different way. He's a professor of theoretical cosmology at the other SUNY in town, which is the SUNY University at Buffalo, uh, my other alma mater. <laughs> I couldn't make it by my, my own, so I, met, I went to both. Um, Will's also the author of a new book that's been released called An Infinity of Worlds. And uh, I know I'm going to have that on my Christmas list, and many of you might want to as well. Um, but I, I hear for his talk he's got a little bit, of a little bit of a surprise for us tonight. So, folks, please give a warm welcome for Dr. Will Kinney. Hello. I promise I'll be brief. Nobody wants to sit and listen to somebody drone on for a long time after they've got a, a, a belly full of food and they're talking to each other. But um, it, thank you for inviting me out to uh, give the address to you all. Uh, it looks like it's a really nice conference. Let's see. Ah, good. We're on. All right. So I pitched a talk to Mark that was, you know, sort of a more standard. Uh, sort of a book talk that I, uh, that I that I've given a few places, and then I started thinking about the audience and and what you guys do, and so I'm going to deviate rather a lot from what Mark advertised as my talk, uh, <laughs> because you guys are special, and I wanted to talk to you and you you know uh, about, about what you do, and you know when you think about it, you folks are really keepers of a very ancient tradition that goes back even before history. I mean, has its origins in Stonehenge and Canyon de Chelles. The idea of taking the cosmos, the universe that we see, the dome of the sky, and making a simulation of that, right? A machine that in some sense embodies, encapsulates the universe in a way that you can present to people, right? And this is something that people have been doing for as long as people have been looking at the sky and wondering about it. And so you, you are people who are really carrying on this very, very ancient idea. Um, and you should be really proud of that, right? I mean, it's something that's important. And of course, you all, you, you all know this, but back in as far back as the ancient uh, astronomer Ptolemy and the uh, philosopher and scientist uh, Aristotle, in ancient times, they actually believed that the universe was a clockwork mechanism, right? In the same way that you produce clockwork mechanisms to simulate the universe, the, the, the ancient peoples really believed that the universe was such a mechanism. And in the, uh, uh, in, in the Ptolemaic cosmology, with the, the geocentric cosmology that held sway for 1,500 years in Europe, the Earth at the center of the cosmos was surrounded by the crystal spheres of the planets and ultimately outward to the firmament, the sphere of the stars that, uh, the, that rotated around uh, uh, the stationary Earth. And in the words of Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, the universe as a whole then, this was, the, this was their picture of the actual universe, very much like the dome of a, of a planetarium. And the, the way Aquinas put it was that the universe was God-ordained and man-centered. We were really at the center of the world and at the, in some ways at the focus of the universe. Although not in a privileged position, actually in an inferior one in the view of you know, medieval religion and so on. And, and in particular, these, this universe needed a mechanism because of the physics of Aristotle, right? So it's Aristotle, 
uh, in his treatise on physics wrote that since everything that is in motion must be moved by something, let us suppose there's a thing in motion which is moved by something else in motion and that by something else and so on, but this series cannot go on to infinity so there must be some first mover, right? So in, in this idea of, uh, in Aristotelian physics, motion was an unnatural state, the natural state of a body was to come to rest, and so this m constantly moving universe needed a motive force and a mechanism in order, to, uh, in order to produce it. So it really was this almost like kind of a mechanical clockwork universe that is reflected in, uh, uh, in, in the way that a planetarium functions, right? And you say we still retain that in the, uh, in the machinery that, that underlies the, the kind of facilities that you all use. And of course, this idea of creating machines that, that uh, mimicked the machinery of the universe is, is nearly equally as old in particular, for example, as old as the Antikythera mechanism, which was discovered in 1901. The date of this is uncertain. It was uh, best guess is probably around 70 to 90 BC. And this, they have, and, and what I'm showing here is a recreation of what the mechanism might have looked like. And it was believed to be a calculational mechanism for the position of the sun and the moon and the planets. And so this is really, in some ways, a very primitive planetarium, right? Something that, the, a machine that echoes the motions of the universe and allows you to visualize it. And, you know, this continued, this tradition of making these machineries, these clockwork versions of the universe continued. Uh, and in, uh, in the words of the Nobel Prize winning author, Anatoly France, he wrote that God had no other children but mankind, and all his creation was administered after a fashion at once puerile and poetical, like the routine of a vast cathedral. Thus conceived, the universe was so simple that it was fully and adequately represented with its true shape and proper motion in sundry great clocks compacted and painted by the craftsmen of the Middle Ages. Right, so this idea that the machine that you're using to represent the universe is really almost a literal representation of it is, is present in these ancient works. Of course, Copernicus came along and shattered this ideal. Right? In the Copernican universe, the Earth is ordinary. The Copernican principle, the idea that underlies all of Copernican cosmology, and including modern cosmology, is that we're not special. We're just ordinary. We're just another part of the universe. Copernicus wrenched the Earth from its place and set it in motion in the cosmos. And this really set the stage for Newton's great unification of the Earth and the heavens and his laws of motion and gravitation. I mean, Newton's realization that the force pulling an apple to the ground is the same as the force keeping the moon in orbit around the Earth and the planets in orbit around the sun, completed the destruction of Aristotle's hierarchy between the laws governing terrestrial bodies and those governing the celestial ones. We've always lived in the heavens. And this was realized in Copernicus's vision of the universe. And something that I think is lesser known about Copernicus is that he was the first to articulate a concept of relativity. It dates back well before Einstein and even before Galileo. And in fact, Copernicus in his, his foundational work, De Revolutionibus, realized that in order for the Earth to be moving and for us to share the motion of the Earth, that absolute motion had to be abandoned, that you had to, you had to, really, you had to have a concept of relative motion, that we could share a motion of the planet without noticing it. And he wrote that every observed change of place is caused by a motion of either the observed object or the observer, or of course by an unequal displacement of each. And so this idea of relativity still survives today and has been you know, made quantitative and changed uh, over time, but it really dates back to, to Nicholas Copernicus. In order for us to be ordinary in the Copernican sense, then uh, motion must be relative. And he realized that immediately when he was formulating his, his uh, heliocentric cosmology. Nonetheless, the idea of a clockwork universe still continued, right? And so what is usually considered to be the oldest still operating planetarium is this one. And maybe a lot of you are familiar with this. Uh, so this is the, uh, uh, an orrery built from 1774 to 1781 by Isa Isinka, who was uh, a woolcomber and an amateur astronomer, right? So he was, a, he was an ordinary guy. And in what might be familiar to a lot of you who do science outreach and science communication, his motive for doing this was to debunk a claim by a Dutch clergyman that uh, an upcoming planetary alignment would plunge the Earth into the sun and burn us all to death, right? <laughs> so he built his planetarium in order to show that this bit of religious pseudoscience was in fact untrue. Um, and it still exists. It's in a small town in the Netherlands, and I, I have yet to visit it, but I, I, it's apparently quite beautiful. Uh, and it, it, so it, this is an orrery, and then in the ceiling, it's all done with wooden 
uh, gears and, uh, and and cables and so on. Quite an quite an amazing mechanism that they've kept uh, kept up and kept running all this time since the 1700s. Now, you all, of course, have vastly more sophisticated tools at your disposal, right? And our mechanisms now, the, the clockwork that you all use in order to model the universe, in order to create these, these, these immersive models of the, of the cosmos, are electronic, right? Rather than mechanical, mostly. And, but that clockwork cosmos, that idea of this sort of universe that is uh, made up of gears and wheels, or in this case, you know, uh, logic gates, still survives in this kind of idea that some people put out called a simulation hypothesis, the idea that the whole universe is in fact a computer simulation and we just happen to be living in it. I, I'm not putting this forward seriously and I think in fact we have a lot of reason to believe, we, we in fact as physicists, as cosmologists, which is what I do for a living, I'm a theoretical cosmologist, I study the beginning of the universe, we already know that the universe isn't and can't be that kind of a clockwork machine. And the man who showed us this is this guy. This is a man named John Bell, who was a theorist of quantum mechanics. And Bell is famous for proving a theorem that showed that you could uh, test this idea of whether or not quantum systems, quantum indeterminacy, was something that had an underlying causal mechanism. Right, so there were, th and these theories are called hidden variable theories. And the idea is that quantum mechanical outcomes are probabilistic. But a hidden variable theory tells you that there's an underlying deterministic machine below that that is determining those probabilistic outcomes. And the probability is just about your ignorance of the state of that machine. Bell realized that you could, in principle, do an experiment that would distinguish between whether or not there was an underlying causal clockwork to quantum reality or whether, it, in fact, it did not exist. You could test this experimentally. And in fact, this was the subject of the Nobel Prize in Physics this year that was uh, um, awarded to Alain Aspe, John Clauser, and Anton Zeilinger. These were experimentalists who actually went out and did Bell's experiment and showed that uh, not only is, is the universe not, a, uh, at, at, at base, reality is not a clockwork, it's not a causal mechanism that can be, uh, that can be elucidated in that way, but it, it not only isn't it, it can't be. There are no hidden variables. There is no mechanism underlying the probabilistic outcomes of quantum mechanics. So we really live in a universe with probability as an inherent feature of it. And so these guys have taken away your clockwork universe from you. <laughs> you can no longer model it as a deterministic machine. Now, of course, it's still useful to do that. And one of the things that modern cosmology retains, even though we have gotten rid of the idea of uh, the universe being run by a clockwork mechanism, we still retain a, sen a, a, a version of the firmament, this great sphere of the stars that, that uh, survived, that, that uh, was introduced to us by Aristotle and Ptolemy. And the reason for that is the fact that the universe has a finite age and light travels at a finite speed. You all know this, right? Looking out in space is looking back in time. Telescopes are time machines. You guys all tell people this in your planetarium shows, right? So when we look out at the sun, we're looking back in time eight minutes. When we look at the center of the galaxy, we're looking back in time about 30,000 years. When we look out at the Andromeda galaxy in the sky, we're looking back in time two and a half million years. So the further out in space, the further back we see in time. In fact, this, this photograph was recently released by the James Webb Space Telescope, and this is a deep field image that was taken by pointing this at, at the sky. And uh, w uh, The version of this that was created by the Hubble Space Telescope uh, took 11 days. This took about 12 hours, right? <laughs> Amazing difference. And th what you're seeing here is really a, not just a photograph of the sky, it's not your nice two-dimensional dome. This, you really want to think of this as a three-dimensional image. You're looking out in space and back in time. And the, the, the smaller and smudgier these things are, the further away they are. And you're looking so far back in time that you're seeing nearly the entire history of the universe. This is, I'm a cosmologist and I'm really lucky because we don't have to speculate on what the universe looked like a billion years ago or five billion or eight billion years ago. You can go out and look. If you look eight billion light years away, you can see the universe as it was eight billion years ago. And 
This is now the candidate for the most distant galaxy we know of. This is Glass X Z13, which is a, a galaxy in that deep field from the, from the web. The look back time for this galaxy, the, the, the amount of time that light has traveled to get to us is believed to be around 13.5 billion years. So you're seeing this galaxy, you're seeing this bit of the universe as it was when the universe was only about 300 million years old, right? That's just amazing. So the further out in space we look, the further back in time we see, right? The universe is only about 13.8 billion years old. So what happens if we look out 13.8 billion light years, right? It's actually a little further than that because of expansion. It's about 40 billion light years. But um, what you would see, so if we look out in the sky and if we could build a telescope that was good enough to see out 13.8 billion light years, if we looked out that far, we would see the Big Bang. And if we looked out in another direction, 13.8 billion light years, we would also see the Big Bang. The Big Bang didn't happen at one place in space, of course. It happened everywhere in an infinite universe at once. This is the idea of a horizon or the size or our observable universe. Imagine an, uh, an observer very close to the Big Bang emitting, say, leaving, letting off a, a burst of light. As the universe expands and time goes on, that burst of light will travel outward from that observer. You can also see by symmetry that if you turn, uh, turn, ah, there we go. turn that around, that's as far out as he can see, right? So if the universe is one year old, you can see out about a light year. When the universe is a thousand years old, you can see out about a thousand light years and so on. So this observer looking out in space and looking back in time, the further out he sees, the further back in time he looks, and that circle, that boundary of how far out he can see, that person would see the Big Bang no matter what direction they look in. This is idea of the idea of the horizon of the observable universe. And so each observer, and that horizon gets bigger with time. It moves away from that observer at the speed of light, but it's always finite. Our horizon, our observable universe, is not 13.8 billion light years, but because of expansion, it's about 40 billion light years. And so we see ourselves sitting in the center of this universe, almost as if, almost as if Ptolemy imagined it, with the Big Bang being a sphere surrounding us in all directions at a distance of about 40 billion light years away, and that's all we can see and all we ever will be able to see. We live in a finite patch of this infinite universe. But it is, in many ways, like the firmament of Aristotle. It is with us at the center and represents the boundary of our universe. This is, of course, an apparent effect, right? This is like the horizon on the surface of the Earth, where each observer sees themselves at the center of their own horizon, right? And on the surface of the Earth is because of the curvature of the planet. In cosmology, it's because of the age of the universe. So the dome that you use to represent the universe is really, in this sense, very accurate. If we, th this, is a photo, this is an image I love, which is a quantitatively correct uh, picture of our co cosmological volume, our observable universe, uh, on a logarithmic scale, with the solar system at the center and the Big Bang at the outer edge. And you see here, I think I have a pointer. Let me get that out. Where did I put my pointer? There it is. So you see the entire history of the universe laid out from the Big Bang out here to the dark ages before the, first, the formation of the first stars to the formation of structure in the universe, galaxies, so on, all the way down to our local universe, right? And this really is, is in some way the universe that you represent in your domes is this, this beautiful sphere of our observable universe that you can then simulate and help people travel through. And one of the things I do with Mark at the planetarium in Williamsville is we do a show where we actually start at the Earth and manually fly the dome out through the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data set uh, and show this map of the universe and show to scale how all of these things fit together inside the observable universe. And it's a lot of fun. Mark taught me to manually fly the dome and it's really cool. <laughs> So we, in some sense, live in a universe that is very reminiscent of the universe of Ptolemy and Aristotle. And I think that's one of the reasons why the, the representation of, uh, of the universe, that this ancient representation is still relevant, is because it still really describes the world that we live in. And I think that's just, even though it has no, rep you know, no real resemblance to the Ptolemaic universe anymore, the represent representation of it still matters, and it still works. 
and which of course is why all of you are here now. So now I'm going to give you a challenge, though, which is I'm going to take this away from you, because I work on a theory called inflation, and that's what my book's about. Um, and inflation is, in some ways, a, a best way to describe it is it's a theory for what happens before the Big Bang. So the Big Bang is this hot, early initial state of the universe, and so you, can, you want to ask the question, where did that come from? And the idea of inflation is that before the, the Big Bang itself, before that moment in which the hot, dense universe sprang into existence and, and began to expand and cool, there was an earlier epoch known as the inflationary epoch in which the universe was in fact completely empty at a temperature of absolute zero and governed entirely by the physics of empty space or the physics of the vacuum. And we know from particle physics that, for example, in, in particular, the physics of the Higgs boson, which I am not going to have more than a, a minute or two to, to go into, so I'm going to be very, uh, I'm going to be a little mysterious, that the vacuum can change state. In particular, you can think of it like a ball rolling off a hill, where when the ball is on top of the hill, the empty space has an energy, and that energy drives an exponentially fast expansion. This is an inherently quantum mechanical picture of the universe. The inflationary universe is quantum mechanical by nature. There is no longer a clockwork that we can rely on. It's probabilistic. And so in inflation, the universe begins in this state where the empty space has energy. The ball is on top of the hill, and it drives this incredibly rapid expansion in a completely empty, completely cold universe. And then, in, and then the ball rolls off the hill, and the, the, the ball falling into that trough at the bottom then heats the universe up and creates the initial conditions for the hot Big Bang. This in 20 seconds is the idea of inflationary cosmology. And when you include quantum uncertainty in this, when you include this truth that has been revealed to us by Bell and Aspe and these other scientists, you find that this idea of this initial cold expanding universe predicts a remarkable thing, which is that our universe is not just one, but it's one of many. Because of quantum mechanics, this inflationary, this inflationary expansion goes on forever and ends only locally in little pockets. So the, the inflationary universe is really, think of it as like something like a glass of beer, where the, the beer in between is this exponentially expanding empty space, and all those little bubbles, each one of them is a universe like our own. And we live, our universe, our entire infinitely large universe lives in one of these little bubbles, but there are infinitely many of those being produced continuously into the future by this, what's called eternal self-reproduction and inflation. I don't know how to represent this in a planetarium. <laughs> right? But here's the neat thing, is that these little bubbles, if you were sitting out here and you looked at it, you would see the bubble be finite. It would, it would, it would come into being and then would, would expand in size outward at the speed of light. But the cool thing is, because of relativity, so what you see, if you plot it on a diagram of space and time, this bubble expands outward in space and it will make a sort of a cone shape if I plot time on the vertical axis. So this is the radius of the bubble getting bigger and bigger with time. In relativity, because we have freedom to redefine what we mean by space and what we mean by time, we can borrow from an infinite reservoir of time and nestle an infinitely large space inside this finite bubble. So it's like Mary Poppins' suitcase. You can, it looks finite from the outside, but in fact, it's an, it contains an infinite universe on the inside. So each of these little finite bubbles in this glass of beer has a spatially infinite universe nestled inside of it. And now, the edge of that bubble is no longer a boundary in space. It's actually a boundary in time. It's really the moment of the Big Bang. And we measure time going, going into the bubble from the edge and space along this infinitely large thing that we've nestled inside this little expanding bubble. So the picture of the universe we get from inflationary cosmology is that we live in this little observable patch of this infinitely large universe, which is one of many infinitely large universes nestled into these bubbles that are expanding away from each other faster than the speed of light in this eternally expanding vacuum of inflation. And like I said, I don't know how to put that in a planetarium. But this actually really uh, uh, is reminiscent of the uh, words of the, uh, the Renaissance philosopher and mystic Giordano Bruno, 
who wrote, uh, he was somebody who took Copernicus's ideas even farther than Copernicus was willing to do it. And, and uh, in, uh, in uh, his writings he wrote, God is infinite, so his universe must be too. He is glorified not in one, but in countless suns, not in a single earth, a single world, but I say in a thousand thousand, I say in an infinity of worlds. And inflationary cosmology and the modern ideas in cosmology take uh, Bruno's infinity of worlds and replace it with an infinity of universes continuously being created out of absolutely nothing. So I'll just leave you with that thought. <laughs> I got no more to say about it. But uh, um, So thank you for inviting me to speak. I hope you're having a wonderful conference. And uh, uh, you know, I'd be happy to chat and answer questions. And, uh, so. Yes. God doesn't play dice, right? Yeah, it does. So that this is Bell's work was in response to a paper that Einstein was an author on. Uh, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen wrote a famous famous paper in the 1930s, in which they they pointed out this problem with quantum mechanics. And Bell was the guy who actually showed that you could test whether or not Einstein's argument was correct. And then these guys, the mad lads, went out and did it and did the test and it turned out Einstein was wrong about this. And that in fact there are no hidden variables, there is no mechanism underlying quantum mechanics. Uh, just an incredible thing that someone actually did that experiment. Not much, no, I stick to the cosmology primarily. <laughs> yes? I, I do talk about that in my book, and the, it, actually inflation makes a lot of very specific predictions about the universe, about cosmological observables, and many of them have been verified uh, in a lot of detail. So it's actually a very specific and predictive theory. You can't test whether or not the multiverse exists, obviously, because we can't get outside of our little bubble, but you can see the other indirect effects of the inflationary period. This is one of the big things, is that the, 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 this quantum nature of it means it leaves echoes behind in our current universe that you can test. Question. When I was learning about inflationary theory, when I was in college, it was more after the Big Bang. It was the inflationary theory of Mendel. So is that related to your? So this is the, the idea of is inflation before or after the Big Bang? Yeah. And that's actually a complicated question because people mean more than one thing when they talk about the Big Bang. In the standard, in the old cosmology, it, you, it didn't matter because they all meant the same thing. So the Big Bang, in one sense, means the hot, dense initial state for the universe, right? This primordial soup at incredibly high temperature where you have to use particle physics and stuff, right? Then there's the other thing, which is the initial singularity. So if you take the standard cosmological model, you throw it into Einstein's equations and run it backward in time, you find that the universe is singular. The, the laws of physics break down at a finite time in the past. That is that point about 13.8 billion years ago. Inflation replaces, gets rid of that initial singularity and puts it further back in time. So if you mean the initial singularity, it's still back there. But uh, it, it can go be arbitrarily, it could be quadrillions, quintillions, and arbitrarily a large amount of time backward in time is no longer at that 13, that 13.8 billion years when the hot universe comes into existence. That's at the end of inflation. So it depends on what you mean by the Big Bang. <laughs> yes, question. So will Webb actually be able to see maybe beyond the edge of this observable bubble? And the answer is no way. Right, uh, And in fact, we've already seen as far out as we can see. And I actually have a couple of backup slides so I can explain what I mean by that. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me bring up my backup slides because it turns out that even if you look out with photons, if you look out with light, you can't see all the way back to the Big Bang. You can only see back to a point when the universe went from being opaque to being transparent. So, the furthest back we actually can see in principle by looking at light is back to when the universe was about 400,000 years old. 
the cosmic microwave background. Do you guys know what the cosmic, you all know what the cosmic microwave background is, right? So that's when the, the, the universe went from ionized to being neutral and went from being opaque to being transparent. And that surface of last scattering, this is the Planck satellite image that I'm sure you've all seen, that's basically the edge of our observable universe is we can only see back that far because past that in photons, the universe is just an opaque cloud, right? So Webb doesn't see that far back, we've, but we've already seen the photons from this, right, with the, with the Planck satellite, which sees actually further out than the deepest thing in that Webb deep field. So if we could observe primordial gravitational waves, the universe is transparent to those all the way back to the end of inflation so that we could, if with gravitational wave observatories, we could potentially see further out than that surface of last scattering that is the limit of what we can see with photons, right? Yes? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to see Lisa fly. <laughs> Yeah. Well, okay, yeah, so this is, this is this galaxy, right, which is the universe when this is only 300 million years old, and this galaxy shouldn't be there in the standard cold dark matter cosmology, right? There's been a lot of hype in the press about how this disproves the Big Bang and all of this kind of stuff, which of course it doesn't, right? It, it might put a challenge to a lot of theories of dark matter, right? So that in a, in a dark matter dominated universe, structure forms in a particular way and you would, you would expect it to form later than this, right? So if you, we see a whole bunch of galaxies really at these kind of redshifts, then cold dark matter has some issues, right? That it has to be fixed. However, I, uh, it is true that a lot of these early papers, and in particular this estimate, uh, are being revised because what happened here was when this photo came out, there was a big, uh, everybody went and started chasing the ambulance and came out with papers within a couple of days. And of course then sort of it came out that the, this image was uncalibrated, right? And so they hadn't actually calibrated the telescope. And now that they're actually getting better calibration on these images, they're realizing that a lot of these look back times might not be right. Uh, so the jury is still out on this as far as I know, whether or not so this is super preliminary, and this is just something that, you know, a guy took this image, a cosmologist took this image and did unspeakable things to it and came up with this number, and it's probably not real reliable. And so the, we, we gotta wait and see, once they really do fully calibrated images, whether, whether we're gonna be seeing galaxies this deep or not, or slightly less. Yes, sir. I, I agree with you. I think the story should be more broadly told. Uh, and in fact, these, these, I, I think this Nobel Prize was well overdue. These, these guys had been doing these experiments for a long time. I mean, some of them were back in the 1980s. Uh, and it's great that it's finally being recognized as the really transformative result that it is. Um, because it has, I mean, it's really profound, right? That, uh, that you, can, you can do this test and it tells you what it tells you. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, I would love to see that this particular thing more popularized and explained. It, it's a hard thing to explain exactly how Bell's inequalities work. <laughs> if I had an hour in your complete attention, uh, I could probably explain it without using any math, but uh, uh, you, your eyes would glaze over pretty bad by the time I was done. <laughs> All right, if there are no more questions, thank you very much and have a great time at the rest of your conference.